Good morning, everybody, and welcome in Frankfurt. Uh, very sorry for interrupting, but the TE probe is already in place, so that's why we wanted to go ahead with the live case. This is case number 10, and Swati is ready to give the case history. Swati, please go ahead. Thank you, Professor Siebert. So the next case for the day is of a 67-year-old male with atrial fibrillation. The patient suffered hemorrhagic stroke under oral anticoagulants in April 2017. He is still having mild residual left-sided hemiparesis with ataxia and writing disturbances. The other relevant past medical history is hypertension, inguinal hernia, and tonsil carcinoma. ECG showed atrial fibrillation with a heart rate of 68 beats per minute. TTE showed reduced ejection fraction. TEE presented a suspicion of PFO and mild aortic and mitral insufficiency. The risk scores were calculated as you can see. Chad VAS score as 5, Chad score 2 uh, um, as 4 and has blood score as 4. Thank you. Thank you very much. So with me is uh, Markus Reinhardt <coughs> on my <Hello>. side. <coughs> and Martin Swans doing the TEE. You all know Martin Swans. He's coming, by the way, from a very rich country, and we will come back to this a little bit later. <laughs> so, Martin, can you show us uh, what you have uh, yes, on the absolutely. TEE screen? So, we already introduced the probe, so I already made some images, and I will show you, because for an LAA closure, and I think you already know, we have to do several measurements, and we're going to put in an amplitude device, so we go around the LAA, measuring the, the different dimensions of the LAA and the depth which are important for implantation of a, of a device. And so frequently you start at zero, you go to 45 degrees, 90 degrees, and 135. And I think with 45 and 90 degrees, you frequently nicely can assess the depth of the LAA, but frequently it's oval shaped and uh, the, the biggest diameters for, uh, of the LAA are seen in the zero and 135 degrees. So I'll already show you the images we already made. I think you can nicely see already live, you can see the spontaneous contrast in the LAA, so the slow flow. Let's see if I can get you the measurement. So here we go. So this is at zero degrees. We can see the trabeculae very nicely on this, uh, this view as well. And if we're going to do an amplitude device, we measured, measure the ostium of the, uh, of the LAA and a, a roughly one centimeter going in to have the landing zone of the device. And this is 29 in this, we can see the depth and this should be perpendicular instead of to the lowest point in the LAA. So uh, we got more than enough depth. And then we move on. So going to 45 degrees. Nicely again, the spontaneous contrast. We can really see there's more than enough depth in this, uh, this LAA. And if we move on to the measurements again. So we have the ostium here of 26. And then uh, landing zone of 25. 24 is the, the depth of the LAA. And at 90 degrees, we see the same. No thrombus is seen, actually, but a lot of dense spontaneous contrast. And again, the, the landing zone is around 25 here. And finally, we move on to the 135 degrees uh, view. We can definitely see the trabeculae, but no thrombus is seen in this, this view. And again, the measurements are done here. And if we move on, we, this is the flow in the LIA. And of course, also 3D can, can help you with doing, uh, doing this because, of course, we nicely have a an, an, an good view of the LAA and we can see that the ostium is really oval shaped on the, on the image. It gives you an idea of the, of the, uh, of the uh, shape of the LAA. And now, finally, we can do the measurement with QLab. And actually, the, the measurements are quite the same at the, at the landing, so around 29, 20, uh, 30. So that's the maximum diameter for, uh, for this LAA. Okay. What is the maximum, say again? 20? 30. 30, 30, 30, 30 millimeters. 30. The okay. is the Any questions from the audience regarding uh, either indication or morphology of the LAA? Oh. Good. So if <laughs> then let's move on. So we will do the transeptal puncture, puncture using a uh, radio frequency technique, which is not, not, not really new. I think this is around since a couple of years. We rarely use it for specific reasons. Martin is using it all the time. Martin, why are you using radio frequency technique for transeptal puncture? Yeah, and I think we uh, uh, we started using this with one of the mitoclip procedures we had a f uh, uh, four or five years ago, I think maybe even more, where we uh, had a quite a floppy septum and there was quite some force needed to pass this, this septum for a mitoclip and uh, the intervention cardiologist was really pushing on the septum and eventually the, the uh, the broken barrel needle we're using at that time really slid anteriorly and went to uh, a sort of PFO-like tunnel into the anterior wall. 
And uh, although there was a lot of discussion if it was in the in the wall or not in the in the uh, in the, not in the left atrial appendage, uh, 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 eventually 3D convinced us that it was definitely in the LA uh, in the LA wall, and we had a tamponade after re retracting the uh, wire. So I think for where procedures where the, the transductal puncture is crucial, we have we prefer to use a little bit more expensive indeed uh, a needle, but at least we puncture at the spot where we're really aiming for, and not have to. Uh, 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 get up with uh, or a, a different spot. So again, with with the endorismatic or floppy step, and frequently have the tendency when you really tend to go more, much more anteriorly and uh, and inferiorly. Yeah, and this is the tip of the needle, and uh, this is a needle which does not have an end hole but side holes, and it's connected via this cable to the radio frequency. Here's the cable to the radio frequency generator. And uh, I have the sheath which comes with the device in place, and now we insert the uh, the needle. I think it's a very nice system, and uh, as Martin mentioned, the only issue is really the cost. So if you are living in a rich country like Martin, <laughs> then you definitely should use this one here. Much better than regular transeptal, no question. You see the tip of the sheath, you see the uh, marker which is at the tip of the uh, of the needle. Oops. So now I have oriented the needle towards about 5 o'clock. This is, has an, uh, a marker here, like the regular transeptal. I go in up to the tip of the dilator, right there. And now I can pull back. Can I have a long... Yeah, you have explain on, yep. on echo. Yep. So I'm coming down. So for LAA, we want to puncture inferiorly and posteriorly. You see the tenting in the septum secundum. Can you go with the cursor uh, on uh, on the tenting so we can see? Yeah. No, I mean with the with the explain oh, cursor. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So then we see whether we should go more anteriorly or posterior. So we are a little bit anterior. So I go to six o'clock. Slowly pull down. Now we are almost at the fossa couple of millimeters, too much posterior, a little bit more to half past five. Now I've lost quite, now. quite posterior now. Posterior, okay, yep. that's okay. Can I see where I'm in the long axis? I'm not sure about the long axis. Let's see. It's still that high? Ah, there it is. is it's it? okay. pretty high. So I yep. go a little bit lower. So we check for it's the needle jump. Please show fluoro and echo in my hands, picture and picture, everything. Oh, you can. No, no, that's up to Thomas. Okay, good. So now, where is, where is the needle in the long axis? Let's I see. see it in the short axis, but not yeah, the long yeah. one. Yeah, it's still. Still very high. Yeah, you high. Can come, I think you can come down a little bit because you want yeah, to go okay. to the inferior spot and you're really posterior at the moment. So on the short axis, you can see your... Okay. Where is it on the long Let's axis? Huh? There you go. Maybe you go the other way around, show the short axis on the left and then show with the cursor on the mm -hmm. other one. It's pretty low. Again, huh? Yeah, really superior, uh, posteriorly. But Let's it's see, oh, yeah, okay, posterior, so I can go yeah. a little bit more anteriorly, like this. Mm -hmm. Did it change? Yeah. But I don't see it on the long axis. Let's see, I can rotate. Superiorly still. Still superior, yeah, really. Because I pulled a lot. So uh, let's go to the long, maybe just to the long axis without explain, mm -hmm. so we can see the tenting. Okay. Okay. Where is it? Let's see if we can find you. Maybe the needle yeah, yeah, is spiral yeah, resolvable. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> It's uh, it's inferior, point. right? It's inferior. Yeah, it's inferior here. You see that? Okay. It's completely okay. okay. Push the okay. Probe a little Would bit you more. Do a final check with explain. Yeah. But I think we are okay now. You see a lot of tenting there. Yeah. So this would be a good position to to do the ablation. Yep. Can I have the foot switch? Yeah. Okay. 
So just while you're looking, just for the interest of the audience, of those who aren't aware of the imaging, you're using the long axis view on the left, which is your 100 degree view roughly, isn't it? Where you're seeing the SVC and then the IVC, and then you've obviously got the fossa in the middle and you can do your superior down to your inferior, yep. look at the septum, and then your orthogonal view on the right is your um, short axis on the aortic valve, so you now have an anterior, oblique, posterior cut through the septum. So you're n nicely trying to find your posterior inferior um, region of the fossa for your puncture. So position is okay. Then let's burn here. Yep. Should be through. Yeah, I see. There's still a little bit of tenting, so probably still you can tenting, so a little bit more. So let's do it again. Yeah, okay, I yep. felt the pop. So it should be through. Let's inject a little bit here. Do you see the bubbles? We have no yeah. yeah, pressure. Okay. Again. There are no, continuous infusion again. over this catheter. No, I just injected a little bit to make sure that, but we are across, you see that. So Horst, Martin, yeah. and, um, and Marcus, one of the advantages of what you call it a needle, but it really has a blunt tip. So the, yeah. the RF uh, system, the beta system has a blunt tip such that when you're across, it's not likely to you know, puncture the opposite side as much. It's not a needle at the end, it's a, it's a blunt yeah. tip. That's true, yeah. Actually, um, I, mean, I mean, it's a very good system, it works it works pretty well, but uh, if I would have a choice, I would prefer still something with distal opening because I don't know how often this is the case, but it may be of interest to introduce a wire through the through this uh, device, whatever you call it, uh, and that would not be possible here because it's a blunt end. But uh, yeah, there's no free lunch, so everything has an advantage and disadvantage for sure. So now we are across. Now we can give uh, heparin. I always give 10,000 for LAA closure as a standard dose. If the procedure takes a long time, then we measure ACT, but not routinely. So this is now 10,000. The other thing also is that you won't be able to see pressure with this uh, system. I think. Oh, no, we could. No, no, we could. Uh, we, we could see the pressure. First, another question. Do you always give uh, 10,000 heparin uh, units, uh, even in patients with uh, 50 kilogram or something like that? Uh, honestly, yes, which is probably would be more accurate to adjust it to the body weight, but it's just, uh, I mean, usually we, we know that the 10,000 we are in a good range in most of the cases. Okay, if it comes to a very thin person, maybe I reduce it a little bit, but actually should be a very thin cachexia type person, but otherwise I don't yeah. reduce it. Okay, you just double check zero. Uh, next step is to uh, engage the left atrial appendage, and uh, I will use, uh, oh, I need a wire for, no, he's introducer. Yeah. What I use uh, to engage the appendage is the uh, pigtail four French angled tip. That, in my hands, is the best catheter to get access. Because it has the small distal tail and this angle, both are in both uh, features are important to get access. So just an information for the uh, audience, uh, you, have, you still have the transeptal puncture set uh, inside the left uh, atrium, and you proceed with a, a pigtail to the left atrial appendage right now. Yeah. Yep. Correct. So, uh, should be in? Yep, absolutely. Yeah, okay. Good. So, let me just adjust the height of the table. A yeah. question about uh, sizing. Have we moved away from do, using the 0, 45, 90, 135 to always using a 3D measurement when you can? Or do you feel that still those four sizes are adequate? Uh, I think if you have 3D capabilities, it was already shown with CT and, 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 and uh, uh, with 3D as well. It has a very good correlation. And frequently with the 0, 45, and etc., you have a little bit of tendency to okay. underestimate it because sometimes you uh, don't get the biggest di dimension. But I think the if you do the 0, 45, the, the, the chance of getting a big difference is uh, 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 that you're underestimating too much is, is not that much. But I think you have a 3D capability. You have 3D possibilities you should at least uh, uh, look at a 3D, absolutely. I'm just calibrating the fluoro because we want to use isocentration for the calibration. No, it's a bit too high. 
So uh, looking at the at the echo, I would like to have some comments from the audience uh, regarding device selection, device size. So the at at, at zero and one hundred thirty five, the landing zone is around thirty. So twenty nine, thirty, thirty one, we had, and for forty five and ninety, the landing zone was around twenty six. And the, and the depth was is more than enough, so around 25 at least. Do we have any thoughts from the audience? How many lobes are you seeing? As far as I got it, you want to go for an amulet? <laughs> or which uh, it looks device very... would you like to use? Stefan, what would you use? If you were to use a Watchman device, I think it's pushing the limit a little bit, but you could try a 33 device, obviously. But then again, if the measurement is more than 30, 31, I'd be worried that you won't get a seal and that you might have a so dislodgement. It's, it's too big for a Watchman. Yeah, it might be too big. Yeah. I, I, I don't think so. Sorry. This is Martin from Hamburg, just up here. <laughs> Hi, Martin. Yeah, so Hi. We've got another comment. Yeah. Well, you can go for the largest Watchman or um, maybe even go for... Uh, for a wave crest because it looked uh, very shallow in the other projection. Uh, okay, so we've got wave crest. So just remind me of the watchman. What's the largest size and uh, an equivalent uh, appendage 30, 33 size? 33 would be the largest. 33. 33. I think that Martin brings up a good point. So Martin has done a lot of work with the watchman device. I think a 33 here is definitely worth considering. You'd have to accept a little bit more of a shoulder because of the depth, I think, is one side of it. The other thing is that, uh, just like what Stefan mentioned, because you have a 29, there still is a potential of a leak. But the way that Martin measured only in one area, one location was the width a, a 30. So I think you should be able to make a 33 work. But Martin, this is against your 10 to 30 percent oversizing rule. <laughs> so tell us what you think about that. Well, you have to develop. Uh, I mean, what we're looking for is severe an is, uh, anchoring and, and sealing. And I think this looks very straightforward for a 33 device, even though it's then just 15%. Peter, what size amulet would you use? Well, uh, I think we have to go for a 34 uh, because uh, it should be compressed at least 4 millimeters. And this is the largest device, I think. But I think Horst is going for the watchman sheet, so he will tell us his thoughts. Who said that? Martin. Ah, you should do more procedures instead of giving lectures. <laughs> You're going for an amulet, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is the amulet sheath, right? <laughs> or you need new glasses, so I don't know. Horse, I've got an imaging question for you on the yeah. fluoro. Yeah. Um, just out of interest, you've, you showed us beautifully the LA appendage opened up and your measurements on fluoro. What view is that? That is RAO caudal. Uh, I don't see the degree here. 30, 20. I think it's about 30 and 30 20. RAO and 20 cordial. And is that your view you use for measuring each time? Yeah, that's my standard uh, view, and I don't change this anymore. I did multiple views in the past, but this is my standard approach. Yeah. It, it always gives the largest diameter, with very extreme uh, exceptions. So, uh, yeah? Sorry? So just one other thing about the depth of the appendage for the Watchman 33. Is there enough depth? Well, we did a comparison, and actually this issue of depth, Watchman versus Amulet, I think is really putting an, a wrong accent. You can uh, get the Watchman much deeper than the Amulet because it doesn't move once you start release. There, there's no distal radial force that makes you move forth. I think we will see when Horst deploys the distal anchor for the Amulet, it will not stay where it is, but it moves proximal. So uh, the depths would be sufficient for the Watchman and probably also for the Amulet. Yeah, I absolutely agree. So re regarding, um, Martin is completely right. So regarding the device selection, I think the Watchman would certainly work. Uh, I'm not sure about the, did you say the wave crest as well? I'm not about the size. I'm not sure about the size. I just but did a few, and um, I mean, they have this interesting sizing chart of taking into account both yeah. the uh, both axes, and the largest one should work with this neck. Yeah. Okay. And and I totally agree that the length of the landing zone uh, is not not a problem here, and and rarely a problem in other cases. So let me show the the sheath for those of you who are not familiar with with LA closure. This is the uh, um, sheath that comes with the AMOLED device. And it's a double curve sheath. So in, in one projection, it has this curve. 
I just keep the camera still, and when I rotate around, you can see that there's a second distal curve right here, which points anteriorly. So two curves, one is the anterior curve, and one is the main curve. Uh, it's a 14 French sheath, and has a very short transition between the dilator and the uh, and the sheath, which is good when you when it comes to transeptal. Uh, sometimes it's hard to introduce this through the groin. You should pay pay attention when you go through the tissue uh, in the groin. I I always use an Amplatz extra stiff for exchange, and this is the Amplatz extra stiff, which has. Uh, no, so which has uh, a J tip and a three centimeter soft tip. So this is the soft end of the Amplatz extra stiff I'm using. You can also use others, but this gives me the best stability in the appendage. I like to exchange uh, with the wire in the ex in the appendage. Many other operators prefer to do this in the pulmonary vein and then have to re-engage the appendage. Both ways, are, I believe, are safe and and well suitable. But this is my preferred technique. And you can see I'm pulling back the pigtail catheter, forming a configuration which looks like a pigtail. Uh, and that's why I prefer this wire. When you, when you use wires with longer soft end, this will not work this way. For my information, uh, the guiding cath has also changed with a new de uh, device that is only 80 centimeters long. So it's uh, very easy also to introduce the new guiding cath of uh, St. Jude uh, with a four French pigtail, normal length uh, to the left atrial appendage. Oh, that's good. So you yeah. could avoid uh, uh, changing over the wire. Yeah, that's, that's a good, uh, important point, yeah. And that's something that's been possible with a watchman from the start. Mm. Right. Looks like there's a little fight in the audience between two <laughs> devices, is that? Or maybe it's... Uh, Wrong impression from the distance. I'm doing both yeah. devices. I don't I find against the others. I think we need to make it more entertaining. Yeah, yeah, so, that's fine. <laughs> so uh, just, that's to, just yeah. to speak of data, I would again like to stress that changing the routine from exchanging over the LAA with a wire in there to the pulmonary vein has dropped pericardial effusion uh, in the um, first experience back in 2010 from 10% to 2%. So just for teaching... Uh, um, I know you do it that way very safely in your hands, but uh, to go further on, anybody who's doing it, uh, I, I think many people would uh, like to educate uh, to use the pulmonary ravine. Peter, what do you think? Well, you should do it the right way, and then it's safe, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> just for entertainment. Don't Usually I change over the upper okay. pulmonary ravine. Show my hands, show my hands, because when there's, it's, as I mentioned, sometimes it's difficult to get access in the groin, and what I do is I, I do short movements you, and always rotate in one the, direction. There's a problem with the yeah. yes, push down. It's not the, it's not the drape here. It's something biological. Yeah. So uh, I, the, I just want to show that, yeah, that's better. So I'm rotating just in one direction. For some reason, it's better to do it always in one direction and not back and forth. I don't know why that is. Let me check the configuration of the wire now. I Other. think I'm in. Another option would be to okay. use a pre-dilatation. Yeah, good, good point. So, it's a little bent here. I'm in the vessel, but still not easy. Okay. I think, Martin, this comes to your point. So, as a... You know, I think in the CVC lab, I feel very comfortable doing it with the exchange in the um, uh, left atrial appendage. Over in, in the U.S., because uh, from a safety perspective, that's kind of the most important thing. I've been doing it in the left upper pulmonary vein, just to because for teaching others and so on, it's much easier to do that. And it's much, I, I have more immense respect for him teaching me how to do it while exchange in the left up in the left atrial appendage. It's much safer to watch somebody and teach somebody else while doing the exchange in the left upper pulmonary vein. Well, if you do exchange, uh, I don't. I'm not against it. I mean, I totally agree. Both options are are okay, and both have advantages. This, this little disadvantage of changing in the pulmonary vein is risk of air embolism, uh, which uh, is not the case here. This would be the potential disadvantage: is if you have an issue in the groin, uh, then you are doing a lot more maneuvering like this. Not easy. Yeah. Okay, now we have it. Good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I mean, if I don't feel comfortable anymore, then I can change the position at any time, of course. Maybe to, to share some tricks. Um, uh, sometimes it's actually difficult to get the wire into the pulmonary vein because you have a straight access to the LAA. And uh, I re recently, from a guy doing a lot of mitral clips, um, you can use a multipurpose through your transeptal uh, sheath to uh, then very easily engage the left pulmonary vein. Yep, so uh, th that's really something yeah. I I put into my practice. Yeah, good point. So now I think I'm through the septum Absolutely. with the sheath. Absolutely. I can advance a little further. Now I yep. keep the dilator in place and will advance the... Uh, can I have the device? Just leave it here for now. Can you show it in echo? Absolutely. I don't know if you can see me, but... Mm -hmm. Can we have echo on the screen, please? Echo on screen, Thomas. There we go. So we can see the seed is here. Mm -hmm. Completely true. Is it really, yeah, you, you miss it, uh, but it really saw it popping through. So you know, here we can see the picture going into the LAA. Mm -hmm. So Martin, when it comes to deployment on echo, what views do you do you use? I think, I, I, I think because in the uh, majority of cases in the 45 and 90, it always looks good and it doesn't matter which device. But I think the most crucial view is actually the one under the 35. Sometimes, uh, uh, even with the watchman, we saw that the, the other views look correct and something one under the 35, the device can be tilted and it can be on the posterior side that can be a residual leak or something like that. So I think that's absolutely a view you Thank should you. Uh, should check. Or you do it with the X-plane for the 45, so you have both. Uh, planes at the same time. I think you should use uh, explain as much as possible because you get so much more information at the same time. That's by, uh, and you can see on your explain the image on the right, the yeah. 135 view nicely shows that the sheath is pointing anteriorly, superiorly, isn't it, towards the PA? Absolutely. Right, so that's, that looks ideal. Well, I prefer to do it li like this. So we have both views. We can see nicely see the depth and on the other side we can have the uh, 135 degrees view where we can see the trabeculae and the uh, Probably the, the most difficult few. Uh, Three, four times. Mm. That, that's great. Very nice imaging. So we're just uh, de airing the device, which comes preloaded. And the best way to do this is with a big syringe and just aspirating and injecting several times. Okay, now no bubbles anymore. Mm -hmm. Then we can close it here and connect the uh, manifold to that end. So maybe in the, in the meantime, I can discuss. We, we, uh, yeah. Since a year we're doing the, uh, in our lab, we do the procedure without anesthesia at all. We do it with the micro and the mini T probe. And uh, I think the, the image quality for the micro is, is not that fantastic, but for the LA and PFO and ASD closure, it works quite well. And with the older patient, we use the mini T, and I think image quality is quite, uh, is really good. Color Doppler is much better in the mini T probe, but uh, it saves us a lot of time and uh, uh, getting the anesthesia department sometimes in. I know in Germany <laughs> the nurses do that, but in the, in the Netherlands most of the procedures are done with anesthesia. So uh, it, it helps us a lot, and I think image quality is good. Is it really, I mean, I have no idea because we don't use this thin probe. Is it really easier to swallow a thin probe compared yeah, to a thin yeah. probe? I think the, the, the micro is, is really flexible, so you really should help introducing the probe. So it but cannot go into the recessus and of the larynx? and, and it, it can, but I think if you really uh, help your, with your tip of your finger, it, it has never yeah. happened to me. And, and frequently they call it the transnasal probe, but mm. actually we, we began with putting in the probe in the, in the nose, but actually there's no benefit at all. And a when transnasal the probe, must be cruel. Huh? Yeah, it's quite. It needs, it needs general anesthesia, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, they don't like it, and and yeah. yeah, sometimes you get nose bleeding, especially after heparin, and and so. Uh, and I think even the young patients can bear have this probe uh, really good because mm -hmm. uh, after swallowing it, it's just like a feeding tube, and they just can have it for for one and a half hour mm -hmm. without any problems. So, so you can do long term follow up yeah. with the T probe in place. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. very good. So I, you saw how I de-aired the sheath, and uh, now we are ready to advance the device. How deep are we in the appendage? Yeah, deep enough it's for sure. Uh, huh? Halfway, so yeah. yeah. 
Horst, do you ever use cool flow, just continuous flow to minimize thrombus risk? I know electrophysiologists like doing that. No. Are you doing this? No. No. I usually do it with the watchman, uh, but the problem with the amulet device is that the guiding cath has no side branch, and therefore you can't give an infusion over the guiding. But what I do is when, when the device is close to the tip, I open again the stopcock to make sure that no air has come in. Okay. At the end is not the marker, it's a little bit... Yeah, the distal end of the sheath is a little bit uh, beyond the marker. Okay, I have good backflow here. So we can flush the sheath with contrast and see where we are. Okay, that looks good, actually. So let me rotate the sheath a little bit clockwise, yeah. which will bring it a little bit more down. Usually we have to rotate counterclockwise, but in this case, different. So I open the device, I'm looking on fluoro mainly, and I open the device until I see this little ball, like that. And now I'm looking more on echo, so I'm asking Martin, where is the device on echo? Okay. You can see it's just behind the uh, yeah. circumflex. So, so I can uh, rotate uh, uh, a little yeah. bit more Maybe this a little time. bit deeper indeed. Yeah. yeah. I rotate it counterclockwise yeah. now. And now it's beyond the level of the circumflex. Yeah, absolutely. So that should be okay, huh? Good. The, the sheath tends to rotate back, so I have to keep it in this position here. Little counterclockwise tension. Still okay? Yep, still okay. Still behind. Or can we go a little bit further in? Maybe, like this. It's at this point that the hooks are starting to come out. Mm -hmm. These very thin markers, right? Okay. Did you push the guiding head forward in this? Uh, no, uh, until case? now I, I kept it in position. I pushed the device forward. And at this point now I keep the delivery cable in place and slowly pulling back the sheath. Already on 135, it's a little different than what we would have expected. It seems to be. And I think coming back to the issue of depths, you nicely saw where he started deployment and then the device set them himself uh, into the anatomy. and uh, It's not staying where it is. This, mm -hmm. I think, is a big difference between some of the devices. Mm -hmm. So, Martin, on your 135 view, not quite sure what's happening posteriorly, inferiorly. No, I agree. It is, it, just, wor just worrying there may be a bit of a shoulder. No, I agree. And so that, I was, uh, that I'm the lobe is actually alone, sitting so. a bit higher. Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah you can yeah. see. It's, uh, it's on so, the high side and probably so, will be some flow on the posterior so the side as well. Yeah, so Martin, the lobe of that device, yeah. it looks like it's angled to the point that it's not actually fully engaged within mm -hmm. the appendage. Um, I'd be a bit worried about that. Yeah, mm -hmm. true. It seems like the, the posterior side, you, you can see it, I think, very nicely on this, uh, on the image, you can see it's on the posterior side, it seems to be so too high So it's actually not engaged at yeah, all, so. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So let's try to reposition this. I think that's the problem of the shape of this special uh, left yeah. atrial appendage. Completely agree. And uh, I already had an experience with uh, such a wide opening of the left atrial appendage, also with an amulet, which was not possible to be implanted. And the watchman worked quite well because uh, it was opening like an umbrella. Yeah. I still think that the amulet should be able to be done here. It's just, uh, I think that, you know, you said it from your side. If the sheath is moved forward, then you should be able to get more of the lobe to sit inside the appendage and then go from there. It's not so much that you'll have to do it like a sandwich technique type thing, but something similar to that. So I rotated a little bit more counterclockwise. To come deeper. Yeah. Do 
This will bring the inferior edge of the device more upwards. Looks different now. Yeah. Yeah. Still on the posterior side, it seems to be now I'm still quite hot. Now I'm pulling back the sheath, and at this time a little bit rotation clockwise. Now it should be different. Also, you see the compression of the device is much better than before, but still we have the same issue. issue huh? Yeah, same configuration mm -hmm. here. Uh, mm -hmm. Still quite high up on the posterior side. Mm -hmm. Any suggestions? Horst, do you know that counterclockwise torque you did? Was that the maximum torque you could do? Because I think if you do a little bit more of what you did just now, it yeah. might keep the rotation on and be fine. Yeah, I, I rotated quite a bit, but I mean, you can rotate everything about you know, 60 degrees. <laughs> I think the problem more than that. The problem might be uh, that um, the lobe might be a bit too large for this opening in the landing zone. So smaller lobe. Should we go for maybe, a 30 millimeter? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's what I'm thinking. But maybe before we switch devices, we could test another lobe uh, for distal anchoring. I think now you're going always for the anterior superior lobe. Uh, maybe if you can negotiate more of a, of a middle lobe or even inferior, don't you think you could maybe anchor? Did you see so many different lobes? Let me check again the angiogram. Yeah, if well, you could get so for much. this one. But not so much difference, huh? I mean, very. How many people in the audience are Amulet users? So I'm rotating. So about quite 10, 12 people now. raised their hands. Mm -hmm. So let's hear some uh, opinions from the audience. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, Joe Giovanni. Um, did you have any para, um, prosthetic leak uh, when you had the device uh, deployed? Um, I think it, although there's some over compression, I think it should be quite stable. Uh, but if there is a leakage, then it clearly has not configured well. Yeah. So we didn't check the, for the leak yeah, now. Yeah, first situation we checked, mm -hmm. but uh, what we certainly can do. Yeah, there's, I mean, just from the stability criteria, it seems that there's still a lot of the device that's still proximal to the circumflex, more than what you'd want. The second thing is that you don't, you, you're seeing now, this is the first, this is actually a much better position yeah. than before. Yeah. With a little bit more compression. But we'll see well, what now, you guys see. Yeah, now 50% of the lobe is engaged in the 135 degree view, right? Yeah. But this, on the posterior side, it looks much better now, I would say. Do you want to start with a tug test before we get too excited about uh, <laughs> everything else? Yeah. And how about some color? Yep. On echo. The configuration on fluoro actually looks good, huh? So when you, when you do this with fluoro only, you probably would leave it without discussion. Yeah. So that means it all depends upon you, Martin. <laughs> Pressure on my shoulder. I think you should do the tuck test. Mm -hmm. So I prefer to do a gentle tuck test. That means I just pull a little bit constant force without pulling too hard, just like this. And I keep it for a couple of minutes. And I would like to ask Martin to tell me whether we, whether the device is in a stable position while I'm doing yeah. this. At the moment, you, you can see you're pulling on the disc, but the, the, the lope is not moving at the moment. So mm -hmm. it looks yeah. good from this side. You just see the tension on the disc, yeah. And as you're going round, it's just quite interesting because when you release the tension on the disc horse, it looked like that the top edge of the device was actually sitting uh, in the orifice of the left upper pulmi vein, left superior pulmi vein. Mm -hmm. Would that be an issue? No, I don't think so. Giovanni, uh, uh, let's come back to Giovanni's question regarding the leak. Do you see any leak? No. No, no. you said that, okay. How no. many people in the audience are satisfied with, are, are, sorry, are not satisfied with the device so far? 
You have 100% people that are satisfied with the device so far. No, no. Now ask how many are satisfied, and you will see that 100% are not satisfied. <laughs> exactly, right? That's because they are all sleeping. Wake them up. <laughs> That's because Martin is not uh, doing enough to uh, raise the level of discussion to the point of keeping everyone excited. <laughs> But this was a technique. This Samir was using a technique yeah. which is used by a person named Donald in the U.S., right? I've heard of him. <laughs> jo Joe, are you happy with the device? Yeah, I think so. I think there is uh, a little bit of overcompression, but I think if the tuck test is okay and there's no leakage around the device, I would release it. Generally, I would, I would leave the sheet very close to the device uh, to make sure that it's actually stable so that if it isn't, then you know, I'm pretty close to, to, the, to the device. You mean during release, right? Yeah. So sorry? You mean during release? Yeah, exactly, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that if there's a, a, any um, either leakage or movement, then yeah. you're very, very close to snaring it if you need to, yeah. or, or re-screwing the yeah. device. Uh, do you wonder how you do the tuck test? Uh, well, I, I generally try to pull the sheet as close to the atrial septum mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and, and just give it a gentle pull and have a look at uh, the transesophageal with color mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that you don't get uh, any major leak on one side because if you do, then clearly the hooks have not caught all around. Mm -hmm. But I suspect with this one, although there is a, a little bit of over-compression, over I don't think that the uh, um, hooks have um, not deployed. I think that it looks okay to me. Okay, so I think I now I have to apply attention for a couple of minutes, so I think uh, we can uh, advance yeah. the sheet so device, again. device stayed at the same position, and regarding yeah. the pulmonary vein, we can, we, can, we can put a color, and you can see that there's no change in flow pattern, and I don't know if you saw the 3D image uh, as well, but I can show you, I think the 3D nicely shows there's only minimal of the device in, in front of the, uh, of the pulmonary vein, so that shouldn't be a problem. Okay, so I will detach. Uh, is anybody, anybody against detaching now? So say it now or keep quiet forever. <laughs> okay, detach. Sorry, I won't play the Donald, but um, there is an issue with the ridge. There's sure there's no EP colleague yeah. uh, doing any ablation anymore at this ridge. Huh? Well, there are some, I mean, uh, in, yeah, but uh, that, that's an issue, yeah. But I mean, this patient is not a candidate for ablation, so uh, because he is uh, regarding his AFib, he is asymptomatic. But you are right, so if, if uh, I'm not an AP guy, but uh, I, I have been told that sometimes if you are going for rhythmus stabilization and you want to do a data ablation, it may happen that sometimes you have to Karl-Heinz Koch actually said that a week ago, so it could be an issue, I'm not sure. Well, um, uh, I'm, um, I'm Platz, Gert Amplatz, um, when I approached this uh, topic with him, they did um, uh, um, a, a laboratory investigation on uh, ablation in 10 dogs, and they had no issue with that. I know it's not the same as humans, but uh, it certainly has been uh, done as sort of as a laboratory um, evaluation. So, if you need to do it afterwards, then you can. But ideally, you should. Need, you know, if he's going to go for a ablation, you should do it before. Yeah. So it could be an issue if you have a recurrent AFib and you want to redo it, right? Okay. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, final check on echo was good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Still has the same. Uh, yeah. As you can see, this didn't change after releasing the device. It's nicely uh, okay. positioned, as I would say. It looks like uh, you have a good result. Should we move on to the lectures yeah, for that? Yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.